This August is the anniversary of the U.S. nuclear bombing of Japan. This was one of the worst war crimes ever committed in history. Between 100,000 and 200,000 Japanese civilians were killed. Now, I have no sympathy whatsoever for the fascist Japanese empire. I actually have a very long podcast and video about the fascist Japanese empire and the killing of Shinzo Abe. You can find that at Multipolarista. So I'm not in any way excusing the horrible Japanese empire, but at the same time, that doesn't excuse the horrific war crimes committed by the United States and the liquidation, the extermination of hundreds of thousands of civilians in the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in August of 1945. Now, today, I'm not necessarily going to be talking just about that. I want to talk about something that is even more insidious, which is how corporate media outlets spread U.S. government lies in order to justify war crimes like these. Specifically, I want to talk about newly declassified U.S. government documents that show how top U.S. government officials knew that the atomic bombing of Japan led to radiation deaths, large numbers of people who died from the radioactive fallout. But these top U.S. government officials intentionally lied, knowingly lied to the press. And then, of course, media outlets like The New York Times obediently printed their lies, claiming that there was no radioactive fallout after the U.S. nuked Japan. This information has been known for a while, but we have new documentation that was published by the National Security Archive, which is part of George Washington University. This is a very good academic institution that publishes declassified documents from the U.S. government. And this August, on August 8th, they published this article titled 77th Anniversary of Hiroshima and Nagasaki Bombings, Revisiting the Record. And it found that when Japan had reported on the deaths and sickness caused by radiation, U.S. government leaders claimed that it was false and it was propaganda. I mean, this is really this is sick and disgusting. And it shows how after the U.S. killed between 100,000 and 200,000 Japanese civilians, they lied knowingly to cover up the atrocity. So this... This post publishes a bunch of new declassified documents. You can find these documents at the bottom of the post. I'm just going to uh, I'm going to point out a few of the highlights from the summary. The head of the Manhattan Project, who was a U.S. general named Leslie Groves, who, by the way, got his, his career started overseeing the U.S. military occupation of Nicaragua in the late 20s and early 30s this neo-colonial U.S. military occupation of Nicaragua. So, you know, once an imperialist, always an imperialist. So anyway, the general, U.S. military general who oversaw the Manhattan Project that developed the atomic bomb, his name was Leslie Groves. He was so worried about public revulsion over the terrible effects of the atomic bomb that he cut off early discussion within the Manhattan Project of the problem. He also lied to Congress, and he told Congress that, quote, there was no radioactive residue after the U.S. bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In doing so, he contradicted evidence from his own specialists whom he had sent to Japan to investigate. And furthermore, it gets even more gruesome. Not only did this general who oversaw the Manhattan Project lie he also told Congress that Japanese civilians who were exposed to radiation would not face, quote, undue suffering. And then he, he added, I mean, this is inc an incredible lie. He knew this was false. He claimed, quote, in fact, they say it is a very pleasant way to die. So the U.S. general who oversaw the Manhattan Project claimed that the Japanese civilians dying of radiation they weren't suffering, and actually, it was a very pleasant way to die. Incredible, dis disgusting, amoral, immoral propaganda. So these documents show how, as the preparations were made in, in 1945 for the first atomic test, 
medical experts knew that there would be dangers of radioactivity. So when the U.S. tested the first bomb in July 1945, the medical office, the chief medical officer for the Manhattan Project, Stafford Warren, stated in a top secret report that, quote, the dust outfall from the various portions of the mushroom cloud was potentially a very serious hazard hazard over a band almost 30 miles wide, extending almost 90 miles northeast of the site. So medical, the medical chief medical officer at the Manhattan Project knew before the U.S nuke Japan, that it would lead to this radioactive fallout. And he also knew, noted a few days after this July 1945 bomb test that there was, quote, a tremendous amount of radioactive dust floating in the air. So U.S. medical experts knew it. After the August 6th, 1945 bombing of Hiroshima, and then the August 9th, 1945 bombing of Nagasaki. Soon after, there were reports from the Japanese media that there were deaths and disease from unknown causes, and that, of course, turned out to be radi radiation sickness. And the, the head of the Manhattan Project, which was also colloquially known as the MED, the Manhattan Engineer District, this guy, this general, Leslie Groves, he told an advisor that the reports were, quote, propaganda and that the U.S. had to dispel them, even though he knew that the medical uh, medical advisors involved in the Manhattan Project knew, obviously, that there would there would be radiation. So he was lying. The head of the Manhattan Project, Leslie Groves, would remain in denial, going as far as to tell U.S. senators that there was, quote, no radioactive residue at the bomb sites, and that radiation sickness was, quote, a very pleasant way to die. So, I mean, these documents, once again, just show how the military leadership was just denying all these reports. And he wasn't the only one. Now, here is an example of how the corporate media will launder these U.S. government lies through the press to try to give them credibility, despite the fact there's no evidence for their lies. The U.S. newspaper of record published an article in September 1945, a few weeks after the atomic bombing, and the headline was, No Radioactivity in Hiroshima Ruin, once again showing these lies spread by the press. And this, pre this lie actually came from another U.S. general, Brigadier General T.F. Farrell, who was chief of the War Department's atomic bomb mission. He claimed you know, after a survey of blasted Hiroshima, that the explosive power of the secret weapon was greater even than its inventors envisioned, envisaged, but he denied categorically that it produced a dangerous, lingering radioactivity. Now, note how the New York Times didn't write the headline, U.S. general or U.S. government claims no radioactivity. No, it just echoed the false claims of this U.S. general without any skepticism, without, a sh without, you know, and without even putting it in quotes. They just said, no radioactivity in Hiroshima ruin. This shows how the New York Times has a very long history of just acting as a propaganda mouthpiece for the U.S. government. Now, while the U.S. government was actively denying the fact that there was radio radiation in Hiroshima and Nagasaki that led to many deaths. This is, this is a first-hand account by a physician at UCLA, the University of California, Los Angeles, who investigated Hiroshima and Nagasaki after the U.S. atomic bombing. The real mortality of the atomic bombs that were dropped in Japan will never be known, and added that it is not unlikely that the estimates of killed and wounded in Hiroshima, 150,000, and Nagasaki, 75,000, are over-conservative. And you can see this report. It shows that in Hiroshima in August 1945, the estimated population was 330,000. And the deaths by December, including deaths from radiation, were between 90,000 and 120,000. That is to say, one third of the entire population of Hiroshima was murdered, was killed by this U.S. attack. Similarly, the population of Nagasaki in August 1945 
was around 250,000 and between 60 to 80,000 people died, which is, which is over one quarter of the population of Nagasaki. So massive extermination of civilians. These, these were not soldiers who were involved in the horrific atrocities carried out by the fascist Japanese empire, the genocide. I've talked about that in, in other reporting. These were civilians. And, and note that from this report from the UCLA physician, from the eyewitness report, the physician noted that a lot of the deaths were people who not only died from the explosion, but also from the radiation. And I'm just going to describe some of these details. Uh, warning here, this, these, these are pretty gruesome details that I'm going to be describing. So the physician noted that very large numbers of Japanese civilians were crushed in their homes and in the buildings in which they were working after the blast. Large numbers walked for considerable distances after the bombing before they collapsed and died. Large numbers developed vomiting and bloody and watery diarrhea with extreme weakness and then died in the first and second weeks after the bombing. Also, there were many deaths from internal injuries and from burns. Those deaths were very common. Many burns. And then also in the weeks and months after, there were many deaths that were that began to occur from purpura, which is like uh, this coloration of the skin where you have like all these rashes. I'm not going to show photos because it's really gruesome and horrific. So this is an eyewitness account from a doctor. The U.S. government obviously lied. It knew that it was lying about radiation deaths and the corporate media, the New York Times and other newspapers, they know it, they spread those lies. Now, I talked in the video and podcast I did about Shinzo Abe and the horrific crimes of his grandfather, who was the colonial overlord in the Japanese colonized uh, Japanese colony of Manchuria, which is Manchukuo. I've talked about that the horrific crimes committed, the genocide against Chinese people, 16 to 20 million Chinese people died in, in World War II. And then, you know, the Japanese... Uh, horrific crimes committed in Korea and Philippines and other parts of Southeast Asia. Now, I also talked in that in that video and podcast about how the U.S. government itself admitted that the atomic bombing of Japan was not necessary. Like I said, I am not in any way trying to downplay the horrific genocidal atrocities of the Japanese Empire, and some people try to defend the U.S. bombing, the U.S. atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, claiming that basically it was like an anti-fascist atrocity. No, that's absurd. The U.S. government itself admitted that it was not necessary. The U.S. Department of the War, of Department of War, which is what it was called at the time, had something called the Strategic Bombing Survey, which you can find at the Harry S. Truman Library, trumanlibrary.gov. And this U.S. government document admitted in 1945, this is an exact quote from the U.S. government, quote, Based on a detailed investigation of all the facts and supported by the testimony of the surviving Japanese leaders involved, it is the survey's opinion that certainly prior to, to December 1945 and in all, prior, in all probability prior to November 1945, Japan would have surrendered even if the atomic bombs had not been dropped, even if Russia, that is the Soviet Union, had not entered the war, and even if no invasion had been planned or contemplated. So the atomic bombing was not necessary. I detailed this using a bunch of, you know, academic sources and mainstream sources over at multipolarista.com. I'm going to have a link to that in the description of this video. And this is, this is for the video and podcast that I did titled U.S.-backed fascism in Japan, how Shinzo Abe whitewashed genocidal imperial crimes. I have all the links in there. But just to review it really quickly, the Manhattan Project has an official government website at the U.S. Department of Energy, osti.gov. All the links to this are in the multipolarista.com article that I post in the description below. And this admits that, that the reason that the U.S. killed between 100,000 and 200,000 Japanese civilians in this horrific crime of the atomic bombing was because it was a threat 
against the Soviet Union. It was assigned to the Soviet Union. It was the first crime committed in the first Cold War. This is admitted by the, the Manhattan Project we, uh, website at the Department of Energy. The U.S. government admits that President Truman, his need for the help of the Soviet Union in the war against Japan was greatly diminished when he received word of the atomic bombing. And Truman and his advisors were not sure if they wanted the Soviet Union's help in its war against Japan. And they noted that if use of the atomic bomb made victory possible without a Soviet invasion, then accepting Soviet help would only invite them into the discussions regarding the post-war fate of Japan. So basically, the U.S. government wanted to control Japan after, or the U.S. government wanted to control Japan after World War II and didn't want the Soviet Union to have any influence and certainly didn't want Japan to go socialist. And there were a lot of socialists in Japan at the time. So historians note that Japan would have surrendered even without the use of the atomic bomb. And that in fact, Truman and his advisors used the bomb only in an effort to intimidate the Soviet Union. Truman hoped to avoid having to share the administration of Japan with the Soviet Union. These are the quotes from the U.S. government website. This has also been acknowledged. You know, here's the History Channel, which is not a great source, but History.com published an article this uh, in 2018, but they updated it in 2020, noting that the Hiroshima bombing didn't just end World War II. It kick-started the Cold War. And I also discussed in the video and podcast I did in Shinzo Abe, this article in Foreign Policy Magazine, the you know establishment mouthpiece of Washington. This article is by a mainstream historian who, who has done a lot of research on nuclear weapons, Ward Wilson. And the, the head article Foreign Policy is titled, The Bomb Didn't Defeat Japan, Stalin Did. And he goes through this history there. So not only did the U.S. government kill between 100,000 and 200,000 Japanese civilians. Not only did the U.S. government not have to do that, not only did the U.S. kill hundreds of thousands of Japanese civilians as an act of aggression against the Soviet Union as the first crime of the first Cold War in order to prevent Japan from going socialist and turning Japan basically into U.S. colony. Not only did the U.S. do all of that, the U.S. government officials overseeing the Manhattan Project, the atomic bomb construction creation, they lied about radiation knowingly. They lied about the horrific impact on Japanese civilians. Unfortunately, it shows how little the U.S. government actually cared about the Japanese civilians that it claimed it was saving. So once again, the U.S. Uh, crimes in Japan should not be whitewashed just because the horrible fascist Japanese empire committed genocide. Both of them were committed horrific crimes and they need to be acknowledged.